Hello, my name is Sophia Patrikas, and I'm a clinical audiologist with Hudson Valley Audiology. Today I'm going to be speaking about cochlear implant candidacy and what that journey entails. So just a little bit about myself. I have my audiology doctorate from the Long Island Consortium, so St. John's, Hofstra, and Adelphi Universities, and I've been with the practice since 2017. I did start off as a resident here in 2016. Um, I am also an adjunct professor with the SUNY New Paltz Communication Disorders Program. Um, clinically, I see patients of all ages uh, for diagnostics and treatment, so um, hearing aids um, and implantable devices. So here at Hudson Valley Audiology, we provide a large range of services, hearing evaluations, tinnitus evaluations, um, hearing aids, cochlear implants, and we provide balance assessments, vestibular evaluations, um, and we also provide outreach, so these monthly webinars um, and our radio show, which is a monthly radio show on WRCR. So today we're here to talk about cochlear implants. And the agenda will be, I'll begin with a brief overview of the auditory system and hearing loss. We'll talk about, talk about cochlear implant candidacy and what the path to implantation looks like, and then what to expect afterwards. What are the benefits of cochlear implantation? So here we have our peripheral auditory system. And the central auditory system is our brain, the neural pathways that's not shown on this image. But as sound travels through our ear canal, it reaches our eardrum, which in turn vibrates, moves our middle ear system, and this sound sends sound waves to our inner ear, or our cochlea, which is a fascinating and complex fluid-filled system. So you can see this image zooms in on that cochlea. And within this fluid, we have thousands of sensory hair cells, and with their job being to fine-tune and boost volume of the signal to the brain. So you can see there are many different anatomical sites along this auditory system where we can have a breakdown. And this can lead to either temporary or permanent hearing loss. For today's lecture, I will focus on sensory neural hearing loss or damage to the cochlea and those hair cell structures. So when these hair cells are damaged, they do not regenerate. So these damaged hair cells do result in a permanent hearing loss of varying degrees. Um, and when I say hearing loss, that is in terms of a lack of volume, but also distortion in that auditory signal. So this is another view of those hair cells. It's a view of the cochlea. There are thousands. 30,000 hair cells that help transmit this signal of a low voltage electricity to the brain. Again, their job being to fine tune and boost the signal. So what might cause damage to these hair cells? What might cause this permanent sensory neural hearing loss? Many things can unfortunately cause hearing loss. Aging, noise exposure, head trauma, some certain medications, some strong chemotherapy agents, um, an infection or a virus. Um, sometimes it's congenital, meaning you're born with it, um, or there is a genetic mutation. Um, sometimes we don't know what causes this damage. Um, it might be unknown. But again, once these hair cells, once these structures are damaged, it does result in that permanent hearing loss and distortion of the signal. So what we're looking at here is an audiogram, which is the graph of an individual's hearing sensitivity. And you can see there are different degrees of hearing loss across the frequency range. You can see on this colorful left-sided graph. Um, the graph on the right is showing a hearing loss that's been diagnosed. It's an essentially moderate to profound hearing loss, sensory and neural in nature. So once you have an audiogram, you've had this evaluation completed by an audiologist, along with other components of the test battery, there may be more treatment or management options other than just hearing aids. 
So one of the reasons I chose this topic to discuss and why I like to hold this talk is really for awareness, not only of cochlear implants, but of hearing and hearing loss in general. So this survey from earlier this year, 2022, reveals that only 9% of adults ages 50 to 80 years of age are able to understand what normal hearing is. And we can see when compared to other health con common health conditions, high cholesterol, blood pressure issues, vision loss, 9% um, understanding is very poor. And this is alarming since hearing loss ranks among the most prevalent and undertreated disabilities worldwide. So in the United States alone, one in eight adults and more than two thirds of individuals over the age of 70 suffer from varying degrees of hearing loss. And most adults believe that few treatment options exist for management of this hearing loss. So it's our job as audiologists to educate the general public. So if there is a diagnosed hearing loss, your audiologist will guide you with their professional recommendation. Hearing aids can benefit a patient with hearing loss thresholds anywhere from mild sloping to severe to profound hearing loss, but a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation may be indicated when appropriately fit hearing aids do not benefit the patient enough. So that is just the short of it. Now let's dive into what cochlear implant process involves. So what is a cochlear implant? A cochlear implant is a surgically implanted device placed in the cochlea, allowing for electrical stimulation. So we're essentially replacing the hair cells in the cochlear structure that are substantially damaged. You can see in this image that there is an internal device. So the image on the right hand side, that's the actual implant. And there are also external devices you can see on the left hand side called processor or the transmitter. These external devices contain microphones that pick up sound and allow for communication with the internal implant. So you can see how with a cochlear implant, the patient is now hearing with electrical stimulation, which is very different than a hearing aid, which is considered acoustic hearing. So you may be a cochlear implant candidate if you suffer from moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss, receive limited benefit from your hearing aids, have no medical conditions putting you at risk during surgery, and have an unaided speech recognition score less than or equal to 60% in the better ear. So what does this actually look like for the patient? This might manifest in difficulty hearing in noise, communicating on the phone, having to turn the television up, just this continued lack of clarity, even with very good and very appropriately programmed hearing aids. You still might have to really rely on those visual cues, that nonverbal communication. Um, you might find yourself withdrawing from social events and group gatherings, continually asking for repetition, um, and the list can continue. Um, all of these challenges, these barriers, often hold true not just for CI candidates, um, but potentially for hearing aid candidates as well. So what does this path to cochlear implantation entail? The first step would be to have a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation with an audiologist. Assuming you're a candidate audiologically, you would be referred to a neurotologist or an ENT who specializes in cochlear implants, and they would perform a medical evaluation to make sure that there are no contraindications to implantation. You would have an outpatient surgery. It usually takes about an hour and a half, and you go home the same day. About three to four weeks postoperatively, you would have an activation. So the three to four weeks allows for the surgical site to heal. At that activation, that's when that external sound processor would be placed on the head and you would begin the journey of relearning how to hear with electrical stimulation or with your cochlear implant. 
It's important to note that follow-up mapping or programming appointments with your audiologist are necessary, as well as oral rehabilitation or speech therapy, listening therapy. This will help the brain further adjust and benefit from the cochlear implant. So when you see your audiologist for the cochlear implant candidacy evaluation, they'll complete a full hearing evaluation. They will look at your speech understanding with current hearing aids and evaluate your subjective benefit from your current hearing aids. So how are you perceiving your hearing loss? They'll also discuss lifestyle considerations. What does your day to day look like? Um, and discuss your support system um, at home. Some patients might be candidates for a hybrid hearing or a hybrid cochlear implant. So this allows us to utilize any residual low frequency hearing. So any hearing that might be still remaining that can be amplified with a hearing aid or with acoustic hearing while stimulating the regions of the auditory system that need to use electrical stimulation with the cochlear implant. So on the same ear, you will have acoustic hearing and electric stimulation. You can see in this image, we have in the ear canal, there's a dome with a speaker, and then the portion of the cochlear implant sound processor is up behind the ear. Again, hybrid in the same ear. So as we've already discussed, the patient's subjective difficulties on hearing are also very relevant in the cochlear implant candidacy evaluation. So your audiologist will have you complete some questionnaires to get insight into how you perceive your hearing loss on a day-to-day -day basis. So how are you functioning in noisy environments, small groups, in certain environments that are part of your daily routine? There's also importance in performing cognitive screeners, so looking at dementia, um, as we are really working with the brain and cognition when treating hearing loss, whether it's with hearing aids or an implantable device. So it's often very difficult to give the cochlear implant candidate an exact number of what to expect as far as speech understandment improvements. There are numerous factors surrounding that progress, including age of hearing loss onset, how consistently were hearing aids used, when did that intervention begin, are there any other health concerns, any other diagnoses, um, any cognitive concerns. Um, so that's just to name a few. But we do know that there are research-based expectations following implantation. We expect improved auditory awareness, improved speech and language skills, quality of life, improved employment opportunities, um, improved hearing and noise, um, and that just is really scratching the surface. So this was a study conducted in 2018, or a survey, and that looked at patient satisfaction with hearing aids, with two hearing aids, versus when they were implanted. So you'll see that pre-implantation, so when the patient's just wearing two hearing aids, only 9% of patients were satisfied with their hearing solution, compared to an implant where 95% of patients were generally satisfied or very satisfied with their subjective hearing. And this also is broken down into some other categories, understanding on television, small group conversations, um, hearing in background noise, music appreciation, understanding on the phone. So you can see in the blue column, that's saying what is the overall satisfaction in general of patients in those categories. You can see all of those percentages are fairly low compared to the orange column where we see the percentages increase significantly across the board there. So that previous study was looking at two hearing aids versus the bimodal situation. So what the bimodal hearing setup is, is when a patient has a hearing aid in one ear and a cochlear implant in the other ear. So bimodal, two modes of hearing. 
I work with mostly adult cochlear implant patients, um, so that's what I'm really focusing on. Um, a lot of pediatric patients might get two, so two cochlear implants, so that would not be bimodal. But just for our purposes today, I'm really focusing on bimodal hearing. So one hearing aid in one ear and one cochlear implant in the other. And there are great benefits to the bimodal hearing. Um, more natural sound, greater clarity, music appreciation, um, just overall improved balance. Um, some patients in the adult population do go on to get two cochlear implants, um, and that would include or involve two cochlear implant candidacy evaluations, um, subsequent evaluations. And it is also proven that in noise, cochlear implant recipients perform better than pure hearing aid patients. 18% for hearing aid patients were compared to 70% speech recognition, sentence recognition rather, in adult patients with cochlear implants. So that's a seven times greater improvement um, hearing in noise. So sentences in noise with a cochlear implant versus hearing aids. So the earlier the better, um, you know, in a survey that was from 2008, over 77% of implant recipients said that if they could do it over again, they would have gotten it sooner. Um, so a little older study, but with the improvement of technology, I don't imagine that that number would drop. Um, and, the, you know, the earlier the better is directly related to neuroplasticity or the brain's ability to reorganize to different input. So with a cochlear implant, the central auditory system, or our brain, is essentially learning to hear again with electrical stimulation, as opposed to acoustic stimulation, in the case of normal hearing or hearing aid users. So children as young as nine months of age can receive an implant in the United States, and there is no age limit for implantation. You also have a variety of different connectivity options for cochlear implants um, and hearing aids as well. Um, this includes direct streaming to a smartphone, television, tablet, computer, um, remote microphone options um, can also help um, in noisy situations um, and a variety of other settings. Um, it's, you can really get creative depending on the individual's day-to-day -day activities but they do allow for most direct streaming um, for both cochlear implants and hearing aids. There are three cochlear implant manufacturers. They are all great, have slightly different offerings. Um, cochlear Americas, Advanced Bionics, and Medel. Um, so this is something you would discuss with your audiologist prior to surgery to decide what implant and external device you feel would fit you best. Um, each manufacturer also has a candidate liaison, so someone who works for the company that assists with counseling during that candidacy period. Um, and another valuable service that they provide is linking the candidate with a cochlear implant recipient um, to help establish that kind of bridge from candidacy into um, recipient. And talking about insurance and cochlear implants, the good news, most hearing implants are covered by most private insurances and Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I have yet to have a patient not have the surgery and implant fully covered. Um, so that is excellent news and very different from hearing aids. So the first step is a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation with your audiologist. Um, you get some information about what might be right for you and if you're really struggling to communicate even with appropriately fit hearing aids. Um, so that would be the first step. It's not always an easy step, um, but we always tell our patients it's just information seeking. Um, there is no commitment when you go for a cochlear implant candidacy evaluation. You're simply determining am I a candidate to move forward in this process or am I more suited for hearing aids? 
So thank you for our time. Here you'll see our contact information. That is my email. Um, so feel free to reach out to the office or email me if you do have questions um, regarding anything cochlear implant related or otherwise.